so good afternoon uh, everybody i'm pleased to see you all here today our today's speaker is uh, swayam trupta panda who is phd student doing as far as i understood kind of joint studies in in our center but also together with nicolas copernicus astronomical center where he does his his coursework he's into his i understand final year of, of the phd with with uh, the, the plant topic of the thesis uh, being physical conditions in the broad line regions in active galaxies and before he started uh, phd here in, in poland in warsaw he well, he did his masters in in raurkela uh, in national institute of technology in india today uh, swayam will be talking about exploring the fe plus mission in active galaxies from quasar main sequence to reverberation mapping so please the floor is yours good afternoon everyone uh, so my name is swayam trupta panda as uh, Maciek said so today uh, I'm going to talk uh, about exploring the iron plus emission, FE for first ini state emission uh, in active galaxies from quasar main sequence to reverberation mapping. So uh, as Maciek already mentioned, I jointly work at the Center for Theoretical Physics under the supervision of Professor Bushana Cherny, but I do my coursework uh, of astronomy at Nicholas Copernicus Astronomical Center. So uh, today's talk, in today's talk, I'm going to talk about first, uh, give you a brief idea about what are active galaxies, sort of a background on what active galaxies are and why they are important and how do we study them. Then I will move on to the central theme of this talk, which is going to be focused on the main sequence of quasars, including the iron first ionized state emission. Then we would move on to understand how we quantify the broad emission line regions using fundamental black hole parameters and towards the end, I will give you uh, a brief overview of the CAFE project, which is uh, the current project that I'm involved in and I'm leading the project, its current status and the future. So well, where should we begin? Well, this is a, a, a snapshot which every one of us is familiar with. So this is a uh, previous year in April, 2019, the Event Horizon Telescope revealed the first image of the candidate supermassive black hole at the center of the giant elliptical galaxy M87, Maisier 87. So uh, this was a powerful confirmation of the Einstein's theory of general relativity, which was made possible by an assembly of a global network of eight radio telescopes operating at millimeter wavelengths around 1.3 millimeters. And over here, this is a zoomed in version of this image, very close to the event horizon of the black hole of M87, and we can see clearly see our solar system, which is a cartoon image here. And there you, have, you see the Voyager, which is the furthest man-made satellite, uh, which has already crossed the Oots cloud. And this image uh, over here, uh, the shadow of the black hole is about 3.7 light days and uh, at an unprecedented resolution of 20 micro arc seconds. Fast forward to this year, uh, well, a month ago, uh, on 6th of October, 2020, the Nobel Prize of Physics was jointly awarded to Professor Roger Penrose, Professor Reinhard Genzel, and Professor Andrea Ghez for the discoveries of one of the most exotic phenomena in the universe, the black hole. Well, I would not be going, going to tell you more because uh, a few weeks ago, uh, our colleague, uh, Mihal Jayasek, already mentioned uh, uh, a brief detail about what the Nobel Prize uh, contribution of all these uh, awardees was. But, this was just to give you a standpoint why black holes are important, but also that it is not a new study. It's a study which has been done for about uh, more than 60 years already. Just after the World War II, astronomers, majorly radio astronomers, used those radio arrays to map out the night sky and look out for these extreme signals that were probed in the radio regime. They made many different catalogs, most notably the Cambridge group, which made the Three, uh, three catalogs in, uh, in the radio uh, uh, regime. And it's a survey out of which 20 years later, Martin Schmidt utilized this quasar catalog and looked into one of the uh, candidates, the first quasar 3C273, and utilized the Palomar 200 inch uh, observatory to get the optical spectra for, the uh, for that source. So here in this upper cartoon, uh, upper image snapshot, uh, 
we have the source which is bright in the optical and we can see some strains of the radio jet emission that is emanating and connected with the central source. Well, it was the ingenuity of Professor Schmidt where, which, where he took the optical spectra and matched it with the laboratory comparison spectrum. And what he basically noted is these, absorb, uh, these features are, were actually, actually the Balmer lines and which were redshifted from the observed uh, comparison lab spectrum. By that, he was able to calculate the redshift, which was later found out to be 0.158, which gives up approximately the source to be about 2 billion light years away from us. This source has later been studied in other uh, wavelengths, such as X-rays, uh, infrared, and um, a facets of multi-wavelength uh, uh, data is available for this source. Well, before going further to talk about uh, this emission, it's interesting to associate these lines which were being uh, seen in the spectra and what are the physical regions that these lines are coming from. And to this enters the broad emission line region. So to quantify this, uh, what is actually happening, we have a central supermassive black hole, which is accreting matter, and the accretion disk is the manifestation of this accreting matter. The matter gets heated up, and the photons which are generated from this heat the nearby environment, most notably the broadline region. These uh, broadline regions are gas-rich media which get photoionized by these incoming photons from the accretion disk. Later, they, uh, then we, kind of, we see emission lines out of them, which are then uh, looked into by the telescopes and the observer which is what I'm showing an example here on the left here of a candidate uh, uh, active galaxies, three, uh, three Zwicky two. It is a cutout of an optical uh, part of the spectrum. So on the x-axis here is uh, the wavelength in angstroms and on the y-axis is the flux of this medium in arbitrary units. So there are three notable things that we see here in this spectra. One, the underlying continuum which is kind of the indicator of the incoming radiation from the accretion disk. Then we have these narrow spikes, which are consistently uh, being uh, emitted at further out regions. And these broad features, which are connected with the broad line region. So there are two important things that comes out from these broad emission line regions. One is their intensities. So the peak intensity gives us an idea how much of intense emission is happening inside this broadline region because of these uh, ionic species in them. And the broadening, which is then fitted using spectral profiles, kind of gives us the indication of the velocities that these broadline regions carry under the in influence of the central supermassive black hole. So uh, to summarize, this is more like a popcorn, but much older, more distant, and more complicated to be studied. Well, Two years ago, the gravity collaboration were, was able to first uh, detect the Keplerian motion uh, in the broadline region by uh, resolving these uh, clouds uh, in, in, for the first time. So here on the right cutout, the first panel kind of shows the uh, full broad profile of the passion alpha flux and the indication that these clouds are being governed by Keplerian motion is being shown in the lower uh, bottom panel where the phase of this uh, line emission at passion alpha is shown and a broad line region model is fitted on top of that. Which, and this characteristic S flip feature is uh, denoting that these clouds are under the influence of some, something very heavy at the center. And that this flip is a notable indication of the Doppler motion of these broad line clouds. But, this is the, for the first time uh, such a source has been uh, resolved for uh, especially the broadline region of these source has been resolved. But scientists for the last 20 years have been adopting a much more uh, uh, involved method, which is the reverberation mapping technique. So let me briefly summarize what the reverberation mapping technique really does. So we have the central supermassive black hole and the accretion disk, which is the precursor or the source of the radiation uh, from, uh, from the vicinity of the black hole. So here there are these two rays which are denoting the direct emission coming from the accretion disk 
And provided we have these broad line regions surrounding the supermassive black hole and the accretion disk, there is a finite chance of some of these radiation being intercepted by these broad line clouds. So what is happening is that this direct emission gets scattered from this media and then comes into our line of sight. So basically, by knowing how much extra distance has the light photons traveled and in get got intercepted by the BLR, we kind of get to know the distance, the spatial distance of these clouds from the accretion disk. So here, this is uh, an observational picture that is uh, showing the continuum, which is directly seen by the observer, which is coming from the accretion disk on the top panel for one of these source mark ADN 335 as a function of the time. And on the lower panel, we have one of the lines which is emanating from the broadline region. And we can clearly then see by cross correlating these two light curves, one can see the aspect of the delay that is being caused by the light when it gets intercepted by the broadline region and then comes to, uh, to the observer. So up to now, uh, about 120 sources have been uh, studied in this manner in the H beta regime, where, and then thereby helping us to scale, uh, get a sca scaling diagram of the radius luminosity relation. So what is this radius? Radius, as I mentioned, is this distance between the accretion disk or the source of emission to the broadline region cloud. And the luminosity is the continuum luminosity at 5100. It's a monochromatic luminosity at 5100 angstrom that is coming from the accretion disk. Now, now we have two information together. We have the size of the broadline region, the RBLR, and from the spectral information, we kind of infer the full width half maximum, which is a proxy of the velocity dispersion of the uh, cloud themselves. And combining these two information together, the size of the broadline region and the full width half maximum of that particular line, let's say H beta here, and plugging into the video relation, one gets an estimate of the mass of the black hole. Moving on. So this was something very monochromatic uh, aspect of uh, the study using the reverberation mapping. Well, studies have also been done for higher redshift sources uh, using different uh, broad lines, such as magnesium-2, uh, carbon-4, and Lyman-alpha. But in order to understand the geometry and the complexity of uh, active galaxy and the black hole and its vicinity, one needs to look at a much uh, wider range of uh, energy evolution. So on here, I'm showing the spectral energy distribution, which is acronym SED. So uh, please pardon me if I repeat SED, it uh, would stand out for spectral energy distribution. Here on the y-axis, it is the energy uh, flux density uh, plotted against logarithmic scale of the frequency. So what spectral energy distribution helps us do is uh, map out, helps us map out a wide broadband range of observation and match our theoretical predictions of the different components that re relate to causing such emission in a given frequency band. So here it's a characteristic schematic diagram showing the different components of the uh, AGN, namely, most notably, the accretion disk, the soft X-ray axis, then the coronal power law, and then we have the contribution from the, uh, the host galaxy and dusty emission that uh, happens at much larger radius. Uh, one thing to note, which, would be coming, uh, which I would be coming back to, is this patchy region, which is the uh, result of the absorption by the intergalactic medium of our galaxy Milky Way. So in principle, the sources which are of extra, uh, extra galactic origin, such as quasars most notably, a uh, lot of the radiation which falls in this wavelength band or frequency band gets absorbed and we lose the information uh, of this particular energy band. So indeed, one then resorts to modeling uh, this particular aspect of the uh, component in order to understand and join in the, uh, the low energy or visible part to the higher energy X-ray components. Another very important aspect of the physics is the line emitting region and the physical conditions that are related to them. 
most important information about the density, ionizing conditions, and then the dynamics in the broad line emitting region can be inferred by studying the spectral information in the ultraviolet uh, observation. Over here on the right, I'm showing a uh, mean quasar spectrum coming from an old paper by Francis et al. from the bright quasar catalog, where basically they took uh, 80 different quasars and this is the mean spectrum coming out of that. So here we can clearly see the underlying power law or the continuum. And then these very spiky uh, emission lines, which are characteristic of the ionic species that uh, are concerned with them. So by thereby knowing the line intensity ratios, one can make inference about the density, the ionization level, and the chemical composition if one kind of gets an idea about a specific line ratios. For example, in case of density, one needs to understand the, to get the density, one uh, uh, takes into consideration the broad intercombination line and permitted lines such as carbon three over silicon, aluminum over silicon, and to get an ionization level, we concentrate on the same ionic speed element, but different ionic states of that, such as silicon three over silicon uh, four and silicon uh, six over a silicon four. And for chemical composition, one needs to uh, take into account a metal line, such as helium or carbon. Uh, well, now we have an idea about what the physical condition can be interpreted from, but there lies a, a big diversity in the active galaxies themselves. So there are these young low mass black hole having low luminosity and low jet power sources and their uh, older counterparts, which tend to have higher black hole mass, higher luminosities and emit higher jet powers. And one interesting diagram to connect these uh, two aspects together is this eigenvector one sequence. So in this, multi multitudes of uh, AGN types, kind uh, active galaxies types can be connected using a, a statistical tool called principal component analysis. So briefly to summarize what principal component analysis does is it's a linear transformation applied to multivariate data that defines a set of uncorrelated axes. So which are then called the principal components. And then they are ordered in terms of the variance captured by each of these new axes. So basically what we are trying to do is to maximize the variance along these resulting axes using the eigenvalue decomposition. So one first creates the covariance matrix of this first hand uh, multivariate data and then solves the eigenvalue problem to recover the eigenvalues and eigenvectors, which are then uh, arranged in, in terms of their maximum variance. So for example, we will have the first axis or the principal component in the direction with the maximum variance. The second component is orthogonal to the first component and then uh, tends in the direction of the residual maximum variance and so on. So this is a very interest, uh, powerful technique to do dimensionality reduction and thereby try to infer and give us idea about a multidimensional set in terms of much simplified vectors. So this technique is not very new. This is the main idea behind the schema of eigenvector one, which uh, in the first place was done by Borosan and Green in, back in 1992. In their work, they utilized 13 spectral properties, which was generated or obtained by studying the spectra of 87 low redshift uh, type one quasars. Here I should uh, mention type one are those sources where we have uh, an uninterrupted view of the central nucleus and is not obscured by any me other medium such as the dusty torus. So we have a clear line of sight view of the source of quasi stellar objects or quasars. And they were utilizing this bright quasar catalog at that time and also had information for optical, radio and X-ray continuum. So altogether, they were able to implement this principal component analysis methodology and recover few of the eigenvectors. The most prominent of them was the eigenvector one, which was the anti-correlation between the optical RN2 emission to the uh, forbidden O3 emission. Oh, I forgot to mention here that 
Spectroscopy, uh, or people uh, in astronomy, we notably use the nomenclature of the line element followed by the num uh, Roman numeral, where, for example, if you have a neutral atom or helium, it will be denoted helium one. So here, Fe plus is equivalent to writing Fe two. Also, in their study, they noted that, that the peak uh, oxygen three forbidden line intensity at 5,007 angstrom was strongly correlated with the full width half maximum of the HP time machine. Fast forward 20 years, we now have plethora of data and surveys to help us identify this sequence in much clearer picture. Here in this notable work by Shen and Ho in 2014, they draw the optical plane of the eigenvector one sequence. They undertook 20,000 of the Sloan Digital Sky data release 11 quasars and plotted them in the same diagram where, which was actually first obtained by the analysis of Borosan Green in 92. So just to uh, focus here on this plot, on the x-axis, there is this quantity RFE2, which is basically the iron emission, Fe2 emission within 44, 34 to 46, 84 angstrom, normalized by the broad edge beta flux. Uh, just to give a much more clear idea, here on the top panel, I'm showing a cutout of the spectra, which is between 44 to 5500 angstrom, that is most notably the optical part. We have this broad H beta line, we have the O3 emission, and there are these two efficient bumps, uh, clear bumps of Fe2 emission. And the one that was actually used by Borosan and Green is the blue word part of the Fe2 bump, which is notably known as the 4570 uh, blend. So this is the exact same quantity which was used later and is consistently being used by uh, researchers to denote this quantity RFE. On the y-axis, we have the full width half maximum of H beta. This is the broad uh, H beta emission, as I mentioned, also being used in the reverberation. And the color coding is done with respect to line width equivalent width of oxygen three. And notably, this is called the pizza diagram. And I will come to tell you why this is so difficult to use this diagram to understand a sequence like picture, which notably is seen for the Hertzsprung Russell diagram for stars, where we, one has luminosity and the temperature and knowing the luminosity and temperature one can pinpoint on a stellar sequence and get an idea of the evolution of the star. But for quasars and active galaxies being more extended sources, it becomes more challenging and I will briefly illustrate why this is more challenge and how we tackle this challenge. But before going any further, it's important to know why Fe emission, iron plus emission is important in active galaxies and why do we study that? Most notably, the aspect of iron emission relates to knowing the energy budget of the emitting gas. And by knowing the abundance, by knowing how much iron emission is coming from these broadline regions, we could get an idea of the cosmic time it follows, and thereby you utilize this to verify cosmological parameters. The iron emission forms by a plethora of different uh, physical mechanisms. Uh, most importantly, it's the standard photoionization, continuum fluorescence, collisional excitation, and one can also get iron self fluorescence and also excitation, fluorescent excitations by Lyman alpha and Lyman beta, uh, recombinations of them. So here I'm showing a uh, shorthand item to Grotian diagram, which is uh, not complete, uh, complete in any sense, but just to illustrate, there are these different uh, transition and energy levels that relate to different uh, spectral regimes of iron emission, ranging from uh, UV, optical, and infrared. The complexity of this atom has been uh, summarized in this paper by Werner et al. 99 where they say that this atom is far from equilibrium in most emission line objects. And this is very sensitive to the local conditions that one needs to model properly. And therefore, a detailed simulation is also needed to understand the physical processes which affect the entirety of the iron spectrum. And then it will be able to help us deduce the density, temperature, and of course, the abundance of these emitting regions that contain this species. So Borison and Green, the paper that I mentioned about principal component analysis, 
they not only did the principal component analysis, but in the same paper, were able to create the first iron two template by removing those lines which were not iron. And this was done for this prototypical narrow line Seifert uh, galaxy, one Zwicky one. So in case of narrow line Seifert galaxies, the, op the broad emission lines are much more narrowly peaked and they occupy the lower regime of the full width. As they are narrow, they occupy the lower regime and tend to have high iron emission, RFE value being greater than one, and are uh, supposedly sources which have high Eddington ratios. That is that their, uh, their accreting uh, luminosity uh, in terms of Eddington units is very high. So they made the template and this helped researchers and has been helping us uh, in deducing other lines and removing the contamination that is caused by this iron uh, two spectrum. And to illustrate why it is uh, a big contaminant and a challenge in uh, studying uh, AGN spectra, here is a uh, snapshot of a 371 level of blended multiplets uh, of iron two emission and which predicts over 300,000 lines. And because these uh, lines having blended multiplets, this uh, sort of emission mimics like a pseudo continuum, almost like a continuum. So really to be able to isolate each line and study them individually becomes a challenge. This is why there have been many strifes done in both in respect to the theoretical and observational aspect where people have drawn theoretical templates using photoionization modeling and then have been able to obtain very high signal to noise ratio uh, spectrum information from the UV templates for one's wiki one using telescopes which have higher resolution such as the Hubble Space Telescope. Later on, this has been uh, extended in optical and in near infrared regime. And one now has a detailed uh, template, both from observation and theoretical analysis, uh, ranging from the UV till the near infrared. What now we have come to understand is that this idea of the semi-empirical, where we combine the theoretical knowledge and the observational lines, which are still yet to be consolidated by the theory, is the one approach that is the most consistent. So to briefly summarize here at the first step, the idea and the emphasis on knowing and understanding the physical conditions in the broadline region of active galaxies is quite important. And then relating in them in terms of fundamental black hole parameters is a challenge which we uh, undertook. So going back again to the quasar main sequence, as I mentioned, I would tell you why the picture on the left, which I showed you before, is quite complicated uh, in terms of really deciphering a sequence behind this, cut, uh, this, uh, this picture. Well, the problem of this picture was in terms that since the uh, sources themselves have a variety of range of luminosities and they're also spread in different redshifts on a range of redshifts, which creates uh, 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 impression of a uh, kind of pizza-like or triangle picture uh, diagram for these sources. So when one really tries to study it again in a flux limited, in a luminosity limited, and in a limited range of redshift, one then starts to recover this banana-like sequence, which uh, is what we, we kind of then appreciate as a main sequence itself. Previous studies have shown that this main sequence diagram is actually being governed by the primary driver, which is the Eddington ratio. As I mentioned, Eddington ratio is the volumetric luminosity in terms of the Eddington units. But as you will, uh, I will tell you uh, in the later slides, this Eddington ratio is not the only quantity that drives the sequence and is a com combination of uh, including other big quantities such as the viewing angle, the composition of the cloud, and also the ionizing, change in the ionizing continuum. So as a first step to uh, try to understand which or what are the primary quantity that drive this main sequence, we started off with a very physically motivated uh, model of the accretion. So in this picture, what I'm trying to show here is the model that we have uh, 
we have utilized here, that is the spectral energy distribution is modeled using two power laws. The first component is this optical UV accretion disk, which is given by the standard accretion disk theory, assuming a Newtonian appro approximation for a non-rotating black hole to start with. The next component is this hot X-ray corona, which is basically the Compton upscattering of disk photons. And this is basically serves as the incoming radiation that is generated from the uh, vicinity of the black hole and later heats the broadline uh, cloud, which is shown here in the right. So here is a simplistic view of what a broadline region cloud looks like. So we have this uh, supermassive black hole sitting here on this part when the shown in a patchy black image and the radiation that is coming is coming very close from this black hole. And then the structure or the shape of the radiation, which is given by this two power law, is the one that uh, photoionizes this broadline region cloud. So just to illustrate here, we have a highly ionized front in which is sitting towards the closest uh, face, uh, which is facing the black hole. And thereby the radiation uh, is able to saturate all the emission uh, all these species which is lying in this part of the uh, broadline region cloud. When we go further inside the broadline region cloud, the temperature of the incoming radiation has reduced to a limit where this region can be supposedly called as the partially ionized zone and some of the emission can be expected to originate from this part of the uh, cloud. Going even further, there lies the part which is now even more colder and then species such as iron 2 can be generated out of that picture. And I will show you later why this kind of uh, uh, stratified diagram of broadline region is expected not only from the theory, but also has been studied in the observation aspect. So as I said, this is this uh, broadline region cloud and we are, uh, undertake a constant density broadline uh, region cloud model and utilize different uh, composition starting from sub to super solar abundances to study the effect of the efficiency with which iron emission can be produced. Maybe just to summarize here, the uh, because ac according to the standard creation disk, the temperature, maximum temperature expected from coming from the multicolor accretion disk can be analytically mentioned in terms of uh, the two fundamental quantities, the mass accretion rate, M dot, over the black hole mass. So basically we are tying down two fundamental quantities of the black hole and representing it in terms of one singular quantity, which is the T max. So this contains the information from where the maximum radiation is coming from in the accretion disk and ties neatly to these two fundamental quantities. Observationally, this T max is supposedly the peak of this uh, thermal uh, component, which is uh, notably known as the big blue bump in the, uh, in, in the nomenclature of accretion disks. So we utilize the photoionization model uh, cloudy, which I will uh, further show results uh, out of that. So in order to tie these two components, the accretion disk part, which is the thermal radiation part, and the other secondary power law, which is the hot corona part, we intend to tie them using a, a physically motivating universal scaling law, which uh, connects the X-ray luminosity of the source to its UV luminosity for a given full width half maximum. This was done for a high redshift sample of sources and here the full width half maximum was taken for magnesium too. But by tying these two together, we are able to physically connect the both components and neatly tie them to a single uh, geometry. And the next step was to uh, where should we put the broadline region cloud such that we can effectively see the radiation uh, and emission in iron and H beta. For that, we another, again use a classical relation which measures the distance of the broadline region, which I mentioned was, uh, was done using the classical reverberation mapping technique. So it's the same diagram shown here again, where on the y-axis we have the broadline region size or the RBLR in light days. And on the x-axis, we have the monochromatic luminosity at 5100 angstrom. So these are a bunch of sources. And then it, this line on top uh, is agreeing to standard photoionization theory where the radius is proportional to luminosity to the bar half. All right, so now we have tied and uh, placed our broadline region cloud at 
uh, distance which is given by this relation uh, of radius and luminosity and have uh, characterized the two components neatly together by using this observational relation. Now, when we repeat our modeling for different features of Eddington ratios, of different compositions, and also accounting for different densities inside these clouds, because for a given density, we expect to see emissions uh, for these uh, low ionization species like iron and uh, hydrogen beta. In this, uh, in this picture I am showing on the background in the gray points are all the observational sources coming from the Sloan Digital Sky DR11 uh, catalog, which was done the same way as the paper I showed, uh, the pizza diagram I showed. So it's the same uh, number of sources. And then we do a quality control on top of these sources. And this is basically uh, sources which have uh, their errors under 10% for each of the measured quantities from the observation. This is shown in the yellow in the backdrop. And overplotted are these uh, curves which are coming from our photoionization modeling results. So by, uh, by accounting for these two component model and then taking a distribution of Eddington ratios and different composition, we are able to map out the background full picture of the main sequence uh, that is shown by the observation. But what we realize is that in, indeed Eddington ratio plays a major role in uh, driving this sequence, but the quantities which are also important are densities and the composition of the cloud, which tries to move the direction of these, uh, of these uh, model lines towards higher and higher RFE values. Well, another aspect which I said I will come back to is that by knowing this photoionization modeling, we were able to generate emissivity profiles for these two species, notably H beta and the optical blend of Fe2. So here in this right picture, I'm showing uh, on, the, on the x-axis, we have the log Z. So basically zero here marks the start onset of the broadline region. And then it moves inside the broadline region. So the depth is actually being scaled the same way as I'm moving my cursor here. So we are going from zero towards deeper and deeper inside the cloud Till the, till the end of the cloud space here. So this is the full length of, or the size of the cloud expected from, uh, uh, for, these, for the model that we are using. And log, on y-axis, we have log z times z. Basically, it is the depth weighted emissivity of each of these lines that I'm showing. So over on top here is the blue line, which is corresponding for H beta. And then I'm showing for reference, 10 most intense optical Fe2 lines, uh, which are these 10 lines uh, below. And here I'm marking this in the box. What is important is one can notice that the peak emission of H beta actually occurs at a phase, at a position of the cloud much before than when the peak of the iron emission actually starts to grow. And this is not something that only has been seen from the modeling, but observations from reverberation mapping, which have been done also for iron emission actually quali uh, qualitatively suggest that iron emission is indeed a factor two times larger than what is expected for the H beta. So our results corroborate in sense the observational findings of reverberation mapping for iron emission. Well, but as I showed you in this diagram, we were not able to actually fulfill the uh, necessary conditions that are expected for the high iron emission sources or the sources that are expected to be the high Eddington ratio sources. So in order to fulfill that uh, missing uh, picture, we incorporated in the next part of our work, a model including a warm corona. Uh, here, I would like to remind you again, when I was showing you the first diagram of the spectral energy distribution, I uh, mentioned something of a region which is being absorbed by our uh, intergalactic medium or by the Milky Way. And this is the part which is actually concerning to the warm corona. So basically this is the part one needs to recreate in order to match the UV downturn or the part which is of the lower energies to that of the X-ray upturn, which is the part with the higher energies. So this is that missing gap, which is caused because of the absorption of, the, uh, of our Milky Way. So it's an observational uh, signature, 
in the AGN spectrum. And we would like to theoretically model this in order to satisfy the full uh, broadband emission of the AGN. This model, which we are using, is coming from Kubota and Dawn 2018, where they incorporated this three component model. So basically in this cartoon here in the middle, it's showing the, in, the innermost annular disk. Annulus is uh, the manifestation of the hot corona. The green patch is the one that is concerned with the warm corona. And this magenta purplish patch is the one which is concerned with the cold accretion disk. So now uh, compared to our previous models, we have three components. Earlier in that previous model, we had the standard accretion disk and the hot corona. Here now we have the combination of three components and you can clearly see the patch uh, and the effect of the warm corona, which uh, uh, is kind of uh, caused as a function of the Eddington ratios. So here on the solid is the case with the Eddington ratio one. So for a source which is uh, accreting at the Eddington limit, we kind of see this clear bump feature which is effectively modeled by observational sources. Uh, but as we go down in the Eddington ratio, we start to see this dip feature over here, which cannot be just simply explained by a two component model. So when we incorporate this model of the warm corona and repeat our uh, analysis, we indeed are able to recover sources of very high RFE values, going up to the range of five to six. So indeed, observationally, it is also a very difficult task uh, to quantify the iron emission as it contains so much lines so observationally is also a challenge, but, but by this modeling, we were able to give a wide range of RFE emission uh, explained by the model of our broadline region. Well, moving on to the next aspect, uh, which has been missed out till now uh, in, in all of this modeling was that we were incorporating a fixed viewing angle. As I mentioned to you before, that when one looks at the HR diagram for the stars, Stars are kind of assumed to be isotropic and symmetric. And thus the inclination is not a very fundamental quantity. It doesn't really uh, impact as much as it is in the case of extended sources like AGNs. So one can expect uh, a distribution of inclination angle and thereby has a role to play in the way we understand the luminosity that is coming from this source. So, over here, I'm kind of re reiterating the virial relation where uh, I already mentioned to you how the RBLR is being computed, how one gets the information for the full width half maximum. But in order to uh, match it to the bl uh, black hole mass or attain the black hole mass, one also has to take into account this proportionality constant F here. So what is uh, this equation kind of is coming from the uh, gravitational potential and matching it with the centrifugal force. And then we have this relation uh, and the proportionality constant is F. Now what is important about this F factor is that it contains all our ignorance of the AGN structure, which is the dynamics of the medium of the clouds and the geometry that these clouds have uh, to play around the uh, AGN. So we, and this is not something that only we have found, but many researchers have actually shown that individual sources where one uh, derives the black hole masses from different broad lines actually tend to have different F factors. Meaning that a usage of a fixed quantity for this F factor might not be a correct choice. And this has also been done in the previous work by, uh, led by uh, Mariloli martinez Aldama, uh, which I was also part of. And we have actually taken down those 117 sources that I mentioned uh, done using the reverberation mapping and found that indeed the fitting of these uh, radius luminosity is much more uh, uh, highlighted when one considers a variable uh, F factor, which is dependent here uh, in a case uh, proportional to full, the full width half maximum of the line. Okay, so a pit stop here. The previous modeling, the, the previous modeling were ma mainly considering the previous modeling were mainly considering uh, as a function of black hole mass and accretion rate. And uh, we were using theoretical SEDs, local densities, and cloud compositions of the broadline region cloud. Now we incorporate the effect of the viewing angle, F factor. And here I il illustrate what basically the F factor in the expanded form looks like. It is one over four times kappa square plus sine square theta. Uh, 
where this kappa is actually the if, uh, extent of isotropic behavior of these broadline region clouds. So under the central uh, potential, we, if this kappa value tends to zero, or it would uh, illustrate more a flattened disk-like geometry. But if the kappa value is much higher, then it would go towards more spherical distribution. So observations have shown that indeed the distribution of broadline region clouds is more uh, flat, flat uh, disk-like, given that one does not see the absorption of Lyman alpha continuum throughout the broad range in different viewing angles. So this kind of illustrates that the kappa value is indeed a small factor that kind of uh, confirms the flattened disk-like geometry of broadline region clouds. We account for the RFE values for each of the types of this main sequence diagram. And then we tend to introduce the observational features in each of these quantities, metallicity, density, and the shape of the ionizing continuum. And this, as I mentioned, are coming from the line ratio studies done previously for the sample of quasars. So here we have a diagram uh, on the left. I'm kind of reiterating this plot again. So I'm showing one of the boxes, which is this subtype of the main sequence. And here in this our modeling, we have uh, on the x-axis, here is the size of the broadline region. On the y-axis, we have the same quantity RFE2, which is here on the left is the x-axis quantity, so it's the strength of the RN emission. And we plot uh, the models as a distribution, uh, as a function of the distribution of inclination angle. So we vary the inclination angle from zero to 90 degrees. And we, as I said, we take into account different spectral energy distribution and also test the effect of isotropic behavior and, uh, in, in, in the broadline region cloud distribution. Also, since I, uh, we were uh, kind of uh, pin, pinning down with respect to the radius luminosity relation, we also take into account the observed scatter in the radius luminosity relation, which is mapped here in the green patches. So by accounting for the two patches for the iron strength, which is shown in pink, and the green patch, which is showing the radius limits uh, of the scattering in the radius luminosity, we are able to give a constraint on the viewing angles for the observation of sources. Here is the full picture, which is basically cut downs of each of these spectral bins, which is being shown uh, for each of these modeling and thereby uh, confirming the effect of the viewing angle, which has a role to play in really explaining the high iron emitters and also the, the main general trend in the sequence. Well, here I'm showing uh, extension of this work because as we understood that this main sequence diagram is much more complicated and is not a single parameter driven uh, entity. What we did basically as an extension, we took a distribution of um, uh, abundances, which is on the y-axis, and a distribution of local cloud density inside the broadline region, and plotted it here is against the color. Uh, the color shows basically the RFE strength. And this model has been done for a, a range of viewing angles, and then one then reiterates to get the broadline region radius. And on the last, I'm showing the radius expected from the classical radius luminosity relation. So maybe I'll stop here and say basically, the point of having to do with this is plot is that possibly from future observations, if one is able to get diagnostic ratios for densities and the metallicity, and also calculate and retrieve the RFE, one can then map that source on top of this diagram and recover the inclination angle and thereby the size of the broadline region. It can be understood in the different direction is that one can, if has a prior idea of the inclination of the source, for example, using radio jet observations, then one can then infer the other quantities which might be missing from the, uh, from the observational spectra. So I'm I hope that I have explained to you how messy this picture of iron emission is, basically owing mostly that it forms this blended multiplets of pseudo continuum and ranges in this full wide range of ultraviolet to infrared. But as we have now shown that this uh, emission feature is not just a contaminant in the quasar spectrum, but uh, in, uh, vital, plays a vital role in the study of the diversity of sources uh, of AGNs in the so-called quasar main sequence. But, and here I'm showing uh, information of how different groups over the years have tried to reconciliate the different uh, uh, broadband FE2 template, where 
there is still a lot of disagreement between the different models put forward by theory and observation and also semi-empirical approaches. This is where the last uh, segment of my talk comes to play is the introduction of the CAFE project, which is where we try to understand the two uh, species, the near infrared calcium two emission and optical RN two emission in active galaxies, such that we can use calcium as a proxy for understanding this much more complex iron uh, atom. So the part one is basically the observational sampling and the photoionization modeling, which we do. So as I said, the calcium atom is a much more simpler atom and it's, uh, it's composed of three multiplets from a five level atom. And here we concentrate only on the emission that is uh, peaking in the near infrared between this 8,500 uh, to 8,600 angstroms, which is here noted in nanometers. And uh, to illustrate why this is so simpler than iron is uh, cut out from uh, one of the past works of uh, uh, source, this 1H, uh, 1934063. Uh, and the three lines can be clearly identified here, it, which are mu so much more isolated compared to the iron emission. To summarize, this, we are quantifying the three lines of calcium versus the more than 1500 lines just in that optical blend of iron 2 that we have been using up to now for main sequence studies. So uh, just to briefly summarize the observational stats, we have 58 sources up till now because uh, we were it, what was important for us to have both optical and near infrared spectral information for this uh, bunch of sources. And thereby, after that, we proceed on to do a photoionization modeling, but we make sure that we take into account an observational uh, spectral energy distribution so that we are not biased by the different approaches of modeling that comes into play. And we also give a prescription of the non-dusty broadline region, which is uh, constrained by a dust sublimation prescription. So here is the cartoon of the diagram uh, which we have generated from the modeling of photoionization. On the left here is shown for the species calcium triplet over H beta. And on the right, correspondingly, it is for that same species uh, ratio RFE2. So this plot is actually a plot coming from the standard photoionization theory, which is the formula that is kind of uh, mentioned here on the center. So the parameter U or the ionization parameter is an indication of the number of photoionizing photons that is QH over four pi R square as a function of the density energy. So technically by knowing, a, uh, giving a distribution of ionization parameter and density, one can then map out the, uh, for a given uh, source for which we know already the number of photoionizing photons, the distribution of uh, what is the emission uh, uh, related to those two line species. So here we concentrate on these two line species. And this red line over here marks the dust sublimation such that whatever emission that we are seeing is coming only from the non-dusty part of the broadline region. As we can see clearly that the two species are very much coexistent and behave, uh, have a very good agreement in terms of their line emission. Not only that, we also find evidence that iron is indeed embedded in the broadline region. So this is a plot from past studies from observation where they have defined the ionization and densities from UV spectra and here we overplot these sources on top of our uh, photoionization model. And clearly there is a striking agreement for these sources suggesting that iron 2 is in C indeed inside the broadline region. And this is the uh, cumulative picture of our uh, results. So here we not only test on a base model of the broadline region, that is considering a solar abundance and clouds having sizes of up to 10 to the power 12 centimeter. NH is the column density, so we infer the cloud sizes by NH over the cloud density, uh, which gives us 10 to the power 12 centimeter, as I showed you before in the emissivity plots. And, but we also try to take a distribution of uh, compositions of the cloud at different sizes of the cloud and try to see if we can effectively model by taking this single uh, source approach, uh, because we utilized uh, ionizing continuum of source one wiki one, but try to extend it throughout the uh, source distribution. So here in this plot, all these solid dots are coming from observational estimates. While in the background, these circles are these different photoionization models computed. And we clearly see a, a great agreement between the observations and simulation 
and suggesting that these two species have an interplaying role among each other. Okay, I will maybe skip this part of the part uh, where we kind of extend the modeling uh, in the theoretical aspect and understand the effect of radiation filtering uh, because uh, it is expected that in order to match the uh, radius luminosity relation and if effectively inferring the radius of these uh, clouds uh, and agree, getting them to agree with the photoionization, it was necessary to in invoke a sort of filtering process such that the observer sees a different ionizing continuum as compared to the broadline region. And by doing so, we were able to not only match the size of the clouds where they are from the uh, black hole, but also generate system, uh, synthetic equivalent widths and were able to also get be uh, best agreements with the observed line ratios for the two species, iron and calcium. And in the most recent work, which we are doing right now uh, with Marie Lolly and others, is that we are trying to uh, understand the, the big uh, information that we have from the observational aspect. So here it's the correlation matrix of all the uh, so, uh, quantities, physical quantities and observed quantities that we have obtained from our data sample. On the top plot here is the clearly uh, seen RFE RCAT relation, which I showed you before. And we also infer the eigenvector one sequence that is shown here uh, in this secondary plot. But also we are able to see a near equ infrared equivalent of the optical plane of main sequence. So this is something very interesting because this then allows us to understand the main sequence in terms of a much simpler species such as calcium. And uh, this is something which is a, a task for the future because we need more and more uh, better observations to be carried out in the near infrared regime. Also, we are also getting information and uh, qualification for Baldwin effect, the global effect being the anti-correlation of the line equivalent width to the luminosity which is actually a function of ionizing continuum shape and also gives us important information of the metallicity of the VLR. So this is an other aspect of understanding the metallicity from observation. And this, this is how we are able to quantify and bring together our modeling approaches and suggestions from our modeling to what we see directly from observation. Most importantly, having this helps us to calibrate the luminosity for cosmological applications. So here I'm just reiterating the PCA, the principal component analysis I showed you before, uh, which is done on top of these sources. So apart from just directly looking at correlations, we intended to see what is the main driver behind this uh, correlation of these two species, RFE and RCAT, or basically strength of FE and strength of calcium triplet uh, as a function of H beta. And we clearly see that for the full sample, both the relations are uh, continued we see that the correlation does imply uh, and the major drivers of these sequence are is not uh, unitary, but is actually a combination of the luminosity of the source, the black hole mass, and uh, thus in turn the Eddington ratio, which is uh, basically a scaled version of the luminosity over black hole mass. And uh, here on the last plot is the ratio RFE over RCAT which is a way to uh, understand how much iron abundance is with respect to uh, alpha elements such as calcium. So we can then infer whether there is a growing amount of iron uh, being seen as a function of redshift and then test this in terms of evolution of uh, AGNs and their host galaxies. And as a last uh, aspect, we also were able to uh, use uh, this uh, proxy calcium too to constrain even better the radius luminosity relation that I talked about. So recent studies have actually found that there is this departure from a one-to-one -one relation of RH beta and luminosity, that there are sources which deviate from this classical relation. And one idea that was put forward last year was that this deviation is a result of, uh, as a function of Eddington ratio, and in turn is also an effect of the RFE. As I said, RFE seems to be connected with the Eddington ratio, but it's not only the quantity. So on, the le on these two plots here, in the middle, what I'm showing is a plot done by uh, our Chinese collaborators, where they have been able to constrain the radius luminosity relation much better by introducing this correction factor based on RFE. But then they also had sources of about 120. 
right now, which we are trying to see with Marie Lolly, is that if this process is repeated for calcium, is actually already for 14 sources, we have uh, turned down the, the scatter, uh, which is in uh, comparison, is comparable to what we find for the sources that have been done for iron emission. So I will be... Uh, sorry, Panda, yes. are you finishing because you are yes, this is the time? Yes, okay. this is the last slide. Uh, so, sorry, thank uh, so as I said, because we are just starting to see this relation, it's something it's in very early works. What we essentially need for all these studies is more future observation. So uh, in that we are also uh, participating in the upcoming Monarchia uh, Survey Explorer, where basically we would be able, to, we think we would be able to get coexisting uh, observations, both in iron and calcium, and then occupy the full space of this correlation and also suggest that indeed calcium being a simpler species gives actually better control uh, for the Eddington ratio and helps us not only realize uh, the main sequence, but also uh, qualify and constrain the radius luminosity relation. Well, uh, so to summarize, so as I mentioned, the diversity of active galaxies in is being tried to un be understand uh, by uncovering the physical conditions of this gas, gas rich media, which is the broadline region, in the vicinity of the supermassive black holes. And we try to tie down these uh, diversity in terms of fundamental black hole parameters. We see that the iron emission in this broadline regions of type 1 AGN is, is, a, is a fundamental characteristic of the main sequence of quasars, which allows us to understand the diversity that is present in these sources. But also, it's been useful to standardize the radius luminosity relation and hence they can be used in the future to be as probes for cosmology. But owing to the complexity of the iron emission, we, it led us to uh, search for effective proxies, such and the one proxy that we find as a reliable candidate is the calcium emission. And this further allows us not to uh, reiterate the main sequence and radius luminosity plots, but also to study the coevolution of active galaxies and the, their host galaxies. Thank you. Thank you very much. For, for the nice and detailed talk. Uh, we are a bit over time, so maybe time for one, two questions, if there is anything. Very briefly, I will ask a brief question then. Could you shortly say, what does it need, well, what, would, what is needed for these to, to, to really become a probe for cosmology? I mean, uh, to, for the radius luminosity relation, for instance, to be at the same level of robustness as some other uh, relations used in cosmology, like I don't know, supernovae type 1a or... So one, this is a part of the project that uh, our group uh, under Professor Cherny is trying to uh, do, is that uh, we wanted to see if using uh, quasars we can... Uh, so the important aspect is to know, get the idea of the luminosity distance. And this is where the aspect of radius luminosity uh, plot that I'm showing here is coming into play. So any intrinsic deviation that we see in this radius luminosity kind of uh, carries forward when we kind of want to estimate the luminosity distance and hence carries forward when we want to uh, uh, try to constrain the uh, model such as the Lambda CDM model for that. So one way is really if, I mean, hypothetically, one, if one was able to get just a clear one line uh, relation for all the sources, that would have solved most of the problem that, that is coming from the scatter. So it's very important not only to reduce the scatter, but also to cover a wide range of luminosity such that we can cover uh, uh, higher redshift sources, which are effectively more luminous. And then we can extend the relation that we have for Hubble diagram and then use quasars to probe much higher redshifts, which in principle, when we do it for uh, supernovae and others are kind of limited to up to redshift two, three. So this is the main driving approach why we would like to use quasars as the probes, uh, but uh, trying to make them standardizable because they are not standard as we can see because of the scatters and the complexity of these physical quantities. Uh, the, the, I think a pre-aspect or the pre-processing step is to make them standardizable in order to be used as uh, potential probes. Okay, thank you very much. So I don't see any other questions. So uh, thank you again and See you next week. Bye-bye. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Bye. Bye.